One, two, three, four. Hey everybody, so in this video, we're gonna solo over Hey Joe by playing off the triads of the chord progression in different areas of the neck. So the first group of triads we're gonna have are these. So we start with this C triad. Three, four. Then we go to G, then we go to D, then we go to A, and then we go to E. And I'm gonna play off those triads. Here's the first group of examples. So that was just an example, right? I took the same group and just slightly varied the way that I added leads on top using the pentatonic scales of the chord. So we're gonna go over that. Let's check out the second group of triads. We've got C, G, D, A, E. All right, here we go. One, two, three, four. On the E chord, you'll see I have the minor pentatonic surrounding the major triad. That's a very bluesy thing to do that works great on the E chord here, and we'll go really in depth on that after the playthrough. All right, now we're gonna try the same chord shapes, but on the top three strings. So we've got this. Cool. Okay, so check this out. Okay, then Hendrix also did this thing during Little Wing. Hey everybody, Gary here with POW Music, and in this lesson we're going to go over how you could solo off the triads in a chord progression. In particular, major triads. This is the perfect song to work on your major triads because it's five major chords. Very unique thing here with Hey Joe. So a lot of people get confused when they start soloing, thinking that they have to play off of each chord. Like, okay, if I have a C chord, I have to play some sort of a C scale. I have a G chord, some sort of a G scale. You don't have to do that. In fact, Hendrix only played E minor pentatonic over his entire iconic Hey Joe solo from the original recording. Here's what that sounded like.
So as you can see, that totally works. But if you want to lock in with the chord progression, you might want to consider playing off the chords. This is something that Hendrix also did. For example, in the Little Wing solo. The Little Wing solo, he started off in just E flat minor pentatonic, but then for the second half of the solo, he started playing off the actual chords of the chord progression using some of the triad-based ideas that I shared in the intro, right? So don't feel like you need to play off the chord, but if you wanna really lock in with that chord progression, that's a way that you could do that in your improvisation. The great thing is you could also, as an accompanist, play similar ideas. It kind of blurs the line between lead and rhythm, which was something that Hendrix was a master at. Now, the reason why I used Hey Joe as a vehicle to go over this triad bass soloing is because the first step of learning the cage system is learning the major chord forms and then the major pentatonic scales that surround those major chord forms. So every lesson I make these days, I'm thinking about the students of my courses, and here I'm thinking about unit seven of my Fret Live Fretboard Mastery Program where we introduce the cage system. So with caged, we see that with any major chord, let's take the chord C, for example, we have five basic chord shapes that span all six strings. Here's a little clip showing you the five cage positions of a C major chord. C major in the C shape. C major in the A shape, I'm spelling caged. C major in the G shape. Or, see I split it up, because it's not practical to go. C major in the E shape. And then finally C major in the D shape. And might as well do the octave of the C shape. Or just like this which is gonna be common. Okay, so then what we go over in the next unit is how each one of these chord positions in Caged has a surrounding pentatonic scale. And anytime you're playing any one of these chords, you could access the surrounding pentatonic scale. You don't have to think about what key you're in, just if you're playing that major chord, you can play that pentatonic scale. And that was my approach in the intro of this video, which we're gonna go over throughout this lesson. And the other thing about the cage chord forms is that within each chord form, you actually have multiple triads. So here I went ahead and circled all the triads within the chord forms. So you wanna learn the full form, but then you wanna learn the triads within the larger forms. Again, this is all the background info and understanding that we're going to put to use to actually create music through the vehicle of Hey Joe. So it's one thing to learn the cage system, as a concept and as a bunch of shapes, it's another thing to use it to create awesome music. So my whole mission here is to teach you the context of the songs themselves. So we learn the song and then we use these tools, these kind of theory tools, these shapes, these patterns, all this stuff to make more music and to understand more music and to expand and reinterpret the music that we're learning. So if you wanna follow me on that journey from step one to step 12, it's a 12 unit course. Like I said, this goes along with unit seven. The link to join is in the description. And you could join us for the live version of the course where we have weekly Zoom meetings. Everyone works on the same unit at the same time and we post group work and we respond. It's sort of like a college class. Or you could take the course as a self-paced program, which is half the price, but you get none of that live interactive experience with myself or classmates. And in each of the 12 units, there's a theory component, a creative assignment, and a song learning assignment. So you're taking what you're learning and you're applying it in your own way and seeing how it actually works within a song. If you wanna hear students talk about how this course transformed their playing, the course trailer is linked in the description. And the day I release this video is the day I'm opening enrollment for the winter 2022 live cohort, limited to 40 students. So if you wanna join us, now's a great time to enroll before it fills up. Also, there's a free PDF to go along with this lesson of these cage forms with the surrounding pentatonic scales that you could have for a reference. And as always for Pound Music patrons, you could download the tab for everything I played in the intro as a PDF or playable tab that you could play in Guitar Pro or on Songster as a GPX or GP file. Also in that post will be the tab for Hendrix's actual Hey Joe solo, as well as the Little Wing solo. In addition to that, by becoming a Pound Music patron, you could join us for twice weekly live Zoom sessions where we go over this stuff as a group, 
you could play for others, you could get feedback, you could give feedback. We, we basically just play and talk guitar for an hour and a half, twice a week. We already have been going over Hey Joe for weeks because I've been working on this lesson for a whole month. And as I'm working on it, you know, I'm, I'm sharing my progress with the patrons and we're working on it together. And I'm taking ideas for how they're responding and learning to bring them into the lesson. Even if you don't want any of those resources, as I just said, I've been working on this lesson for a month. If you really like what we do here with the Fret Live animations and these long form lessons, you could support the channel by becoming a patron. So here on YouTube, I'm gonna go over the first couple of examples in depth as a lesson. And if that's helpful for you and you wanna watch the complete right, that's, lesson, that's, shared, that's also exclusively right, available for Pound Music patrons following that same link in the description. So the first step to follow me along with all this stuff and practicing it yourself is to just know this chord progression like the back of your hand, right? So it's a four bar progression. The first four chords get two beats each and take up the first two bars and then the E takes up the last two bars and we just hang on that E for a while. So for instance, with open chords, we would have one, two, three, four, C, G, D, A, E, 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 C, G, D, A, Okay, now, what we want to realize, what's cool about this chord progression, is it follows the circle of fifths. That's a really cool thing. Understanding the context of things is just another way to lock it inside of your mind. One way is sound, one way is kinesthetic, another way is concept, right? Context. So we start on a C, we go down a fifth to a G, we go up a fifth to a D, we go down a fifth to an A, we go up a fifth to an E. Very clever chord progression, super cool, right? Now the cool thing about going a fifth is that on the circle of fifths, the, the reason why it's called the circle of fifths and the reason why it's a great reference tool is when we move a key center one fifth, in order to create a new key from that new note up a fifth, we only have to change one note within the seven note key. So they're very closely related. So as an example, the key of C, the notes are C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Those are the seven notes in the key. Whereas the key of G up a fifth, if we create the major scale from that note, it's G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp. The only difference is an F sharp, one note difference. We go another fifth key of D, there's an F sharp and a C sharp. Another fifth key of A, F sharp, C sharp, G sharp, and so on and so forth. What's also cool about a fifth is it's the furthest distance from a note that you could go. So you're going the furthest distance, but you're creating the closest tonality. So a fifth is a very natural kind of interval and movement within music. It sounds very natural. Of course, the way something sounds is subjective, but popular opinion would say that. It's also really funny because a lot of guitar teachers, especially in classical music and jazz and very more traditional guitar teachers will tell you, practice everything in all 12 keys following the circle of fifths. It's a classic way to practice things. Like if I'm learning my C major scale today, then I'll learn my G major scale tomorrow and then my D major scale, right? Because it keeps you moving around and it's a very natural progression, right? So this song, in a way, is like an exercise. <laughs> so it's, it's a perfect vehicle to work on this kind of stuff. So that was one way to play it. Uh, the way that I traditionally play this chord progression, if I'm just chugging the chords, is I use the A shape of a C major to the E shape of a G to a D in the A shape to an A in the E shape and then to an E in the A shape. You know, and then you have your... you saw me do all that stuff, right? Okay, now, even though we've got all these major chords, when we get to the E, it's very bluesy. It's, a, you know, when you hear the bass line, when you hear Jimmy's riffs, it's very bluesy. So it lends itself to over this E major chord, playing an E minor pentatonic scale like this. Right, so that scale has this note, 
which is a minor third, but the chord is a major chord. So we're playing a minor third over a major chord. So there's that rub between this note and this note. That dissonance, right? This note I could play here and this note. There's that half step dissonance, but a lot of times what blues players do and what Jimmy does in his solo is bend that minor third. So something like, right? So that's a classic thing to do. Or So just something to keep in mind. That gives it the bluesy sound right there. And every time I get to the E, even though I do sometimes hit the chord tone, especially when I'm playing the chord, I hit the major third. But on my riffs, I might hammer on to that major third, or maybe not. Either way is going to sound cool. That's minor, or that's hitting the major third. All right, with that all in mind, let's get into the triads and play off. So here's the first example. So the C triad, we're using this triad right here, which is shared between the A shape and the G shape. This is the A shape, this is the G shape, right? Hendrix liked to use both. If we think Wind Cries Mary, he went, and then he went, not in that key, but he went from the A shape to the, to the G shape, but the triad stayed the same. Now, what's great about the G shape with this triad is that anytime you play a major chord with this triad, you have this surrounding G shape pentatonic scale. Right? So you could always at any time, so even though we're in the key of E and we can just play E minor pentatonic, you could always play the pentatonic scale that goes along with a chord in any musical situation, just as a rule of thumb. Just think the main pentatonic pattern goes along with that G shape. It is called the G shape. It's also called the E minor shape because within that shape, we've got both this G major shape and we also have this E minor shape, right? Relative major and minor. But in this lesson, we're just thinking major, just thinking major, not minor. Like I said, it goes along with cage part one in my 12 unit course, which is unit seven, which is just the major shapes. Then in, in the next unit, we get into the minor shapes. Okay, so there, what I did is I went just a little Hendrixy. You know, Hendrix did these little flams where you're just kind of hammering on real quick. I call it a flam because a drummer flam is like this. It's two notes that are so close together that it, it sounds like one big note. So when Hendrix goes, to me that's like a flam. Right, you can go through the scale. Doing those flams, right? So. But the key technique here is to bar your fingers across at least two of these notes at a time. Let's say the middle two strings on the fifth fret. And then I'm gonna pick both strings, but only hammer on the lower note, lower meaning closer to my nose. But notice how I'm not blocking string three or the G string. It's ringing out. That's the whole key to this sound. Now me, I have more traditional technique, you know, thumb down, holding a bowling ball. Hendrix probably did something more like this. You 
know, he more thumb over, flatten out the finger, you know, more holding it like like that, where I'm more like that, okay? So wh whatever works for you. But the important thing is that you're not blocking out the adjacent strings. So then from the C triad, I slid up to the G triad. And here we're playing G major in the C shape. But we're gonna leave off the root note so that we have this pinky free to do the embellishments. And the pentatonic scale right here is, some people call it the C shape, or I call it pattern four. I call it pattern four because if this is G major pattern four, this would be G major pattern one, the main shape, this would be pattern two, pattern three, and then pattern four, and then pattern five, and then back to one, right? We go over all this stuff actually in unit five, an entire approach to using the pentatonic scale, using two and a half main patterns as your kind of home base, and then there's sweet spots within the other patterns that we could slide in and out of. So we go really in depth on that as well. Okay, so there we are in pattern four of the G major pentatonic scale. And by not playing the root, we free up our pinky. Again, we could do those flammy kinds of things. I did something like... I did an arpeggio, a slide into an arpeggio. Now, this is great voice leading. Voice leading means going to a new chord with minimal, minimal movement between the voices and also trying to find common tones. So from this G, going to this D, which is the next chord, notice how I keep my index finger in the same space. This is very Keith Richards. Right? That movement right there is actually a one to a four. Because one to four is the inverse of five to one. Let me explain that. So G to D is one to five. G, A, B, C, D. But what is D to G? D, E, F, G, right? So depending on the context, G could be the four of D, or D could be the five of G. So those are the inverse, right? Always inverse intervals always add, add up to nine. So a fifth is also a fourth, right? That equals nine. By the same token, a second can also be a seventh, right? Think about the note G to A. From in the key of G, A is a second. In the key of A, G is a flat seventh. What do they add up to? Nine. Just a little mathematical thing that will help you with intervals. So anyway, we go from this G, a fifth to D. And we keep that finger down. And notice we have a common tone here. This note on the seventh fret of the G string, the note D, is common to the G chord. It's the fifth. And then it's the root of the D chord, right? Backing up just a moment, it you really want to start by knowing where the root notes are of these triads. You want to know what's a fifth, what's a third, what's a root, but start with the root, right? So in this voicing, our root is on the G string, right? In this voicing, our root is on the B string. So if we just played the root notes, we would be going C, G. And then from G, G to D right there. So it goes C, G, D. And then if I just go up a moment to A to E. So 
There's our root motion. Pays to see that. So then we get to the D chord and it's the same, same exact as it was here, here. So I did the same exact movement because it's the same exact kind of chord movement, just moved up a few frets. So that's using the middle two strings for my embellishment notes. I could use the higher two strings. So the second time through this triad group, I'm doing the embellishments mostly on the G and the B string. And now the third time around, I'm focusing more on the highest two strings. I can extend not just the triad, but I can get that higher note too on the high E string. So right, so now I'm playing with this embellishment and then and then and then and I could go even higher. Now I'm using these pentatonic notes as embellishments. And then. And then. Now even though I didn't write out the intervals of anything but the triads, because I didn't want to give you information overload, this note right here, that's our root of the E major chord. Forgive my intonation, it's a little off on this guitar, so it sounds like I'm a little sharp or flat on certain notes in the video as well. But so, right, because here's the full chord shape. So I'm just adding that pinky to play my E major chord. Cool. All right, so that was the first set. So now let's take a look at the second group of triads. So All right, everybody. Well, that's the end of the YouTube version of this lesson. If you want to hear my commentary and kind of deep dive instruction on the other triads and my approach, that's on Patreon and the link is in the description. All right, everybody. Thank you for watching. Happy playing. Have fun with this stuff. Make your own thing. Explore this for hours like the playground that it is. And I'll see you in the next lesson. Take care. Before I go, I'd like to extend a special thanks to the following upper tier POW Music patrons. William Creighton, Andrew Gunthart, Bill Laborde, Boomer Dell, Brad Tomlin, Bruce Yell, Chris Freeman, Dave Hubner, David McPherson, Derek Mickle, Don Stringham, Donald James Grass, Fred Locke, Joff Weatherwax, Jake Martin, James, hey. Jay Brilliant, Jesse Jacobs, Joe Prangle, John Barnes, John Bunyan, John Cushman, Jonas, Joseph McCarthy, Kay Carter, Kent Gresson, LW, Michael L, Michael Varney, Minor Pentatonic, Mu Jang, Nicholas Steinkamp, Patrick Bennett, Paul Davies, Randy Wallingford, Randy Yoakum, Scott Lee, Sean Ellis, Steve C, Stephen Pisano, Trampus Thompson, William Sitko, and all of the rest of the POW Music patrons. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. Happy playing, and I'll see you guys next time.